morning, everyone. Welcome to today's National Geographic Explorer Classroom. My name is Joe Grabowski, and I will be your host for today. All week long, we've been celebrating our oceans with 50 events uh, with different scientists, explorers, adventurers, and conservationists from all over the world, all sharing their passion uh, for the deep blue. It's been a pretty great week. Today is World Ocean Day, so it'll be our final day of events. Um, but it's been a lot of fun and you can catch up on a lot of our events on the National Geographic Education website or the Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants YouTube page. So I'm so excited today uh, to be joined by our guest, Dr. Enrique Sala. He is a National Geographic Explorer in residence dedicated to restoring the health and productivity of the ocean. He's currently working to help protect the last pristine marine ecosystems worldwide and to develop new business models for marine conservation. He founded and leads National Geographic's Pristine Seas, a project that combines exploration, research, and media to inspire country leaders to protect the last wild places. Okay, so it's live, guys. Um, our Pristine Seas has helped create the largest marine mm -hmm. reserves on the planet, covering an area of over four and a half million square kilometers. So just before we meet Enrique, I'm gonna share the National Geographic's Mapmaker Interactive. We can all get an idea of where everybody's joining us from here today. So you should see my screen now, and I'm bringing up the map maker. And here's me, I'm in Guelph, Ontario, just outside of Toronto here in Canada. We've got a group joining us close by in Kitchener, Ontario. And if I back out just a little bit more, we've got a group in Charlotte Lake, groups in New York uh, and New Jersey. Enrique's joining us from Washington, DC at National Geographic headquarters. And if I pull out one more time, we've got a group joining us up here in Calgary, Alberta. So that's enough out of me. I'm going to stop my screen share. Enrique, it is so great to have you uh, joining us on World Ocean Day. Of course, very excited to hear some more about pristine seas and some of your adventures around the world. Yeah, thank you, Joe. Hello, everyone. Um, I can hear an echo. Can you? Okay. Hello, everyone. Happy Oceans Day, everyone. Um, it is great that we have one day to celebrate the ocean, but unfortunately, that's not enough. I think we should celebrate ocean day every day we should celebrate earth day every day right because without the earth without nature without the ocean we would not be here humans could not exist on this planet and there are many things i'd like to talk to you about but today i'm going to tell you about the work that we are doing at national geographic to help to preserve the ocean and uh Raise your hand. Who is uh, who likes to snorkel? Good. Uh, how many of you has actually been able to scuba dive already? Ah, you are too. Oh, a couple of people. Wow, you started much earlier than me. You know, I had to wait until I turned eighteen to be able to scuba dive. But I'm glad that you guys are already onto it. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to start telling you my story and what we do at National Geographic to help to save the ocean. I used to be a professor at the university, at the University of California in San Diego. And my job was to teach, but also to study the impacts of humans in the ocean, the impacts of fishing, the impacts of climate change. And the places that I love so much were less and less alive over time because too much fishing and because of the warming of the ocean. And one day I realized that all I was doing was just describing how the ocean was dying, but not helping to fix it, right? I felt like the doctor who tells you in lots of detail what your disease is but it's not helping you to get better so that day i decided to quit my job as a professor and this is something that i don't want your teachers to do but i quit my job as a professor at the university uh, to dedicate my life to bring the ocean life back and while i was at the university one day I went to this place in Mexico. There is this little place uh, in the Sea of Cortez, in the Gulf of California in Mexico called Cabo Pumo. When we went there in 1999, the place was an underwater desert. As you can see in this photo, it's an area without fish. 
the fishermen were so upset with not having enough fish to catch that they decided to stop fishing completely. They created a national park in the sea, a marine reserve where there was no fishing, where fishing was prohibited. When we return to that same place, 10 years later, this is what we saw. The place that had been a desert, a barren, was now a kaleidoscope of life and color. We saw it come back to pristine in only 10 years, including the return of the large fish, the large predators, like the groupers and the jacks and the snappers. And the fishermen, those visionary fishermen who decided to stop fishing, now are making more money from tourism. They are taking people, they're taking divers who come from all over America to see there what we, they cannot see anywhere else. So this example of this marine reserve showed very clearly to me that if we protect ocean places, the ocean comes back and the ocean can come back spectacularly. So after I quit my job at the university, I came to National Geographic and I proposed something to them, a bold idea, pristine seas a project to help to save the last wild places in the ocean before it's too late. But bef instead of telling you, I better show you a video. I'm going to show you a reel that shows what we have been doing for the last 10 years, and then I will continue my explanation. You know, I've been to so many places, but every time is like the first time. We don't know what we're going to find. Every dive is going to be a surprise. It's like being in an IMAX theatre with everything you ever wanted to see underwater just whizzing past you. Shark paradise. A healthy shark population is a healthy ecosystem. This remote and fancy places, they are the only baselines we have left for what the ocean used to be like. They are like the instruction manual of the ocean. <laughs> It only takes a few fishing boats and they can remove hundreds of years of biomass in just a very short period of time. There's a lot going on to raise awareness of these big oceanic problems. But the real trick is what can we do about it? Commit 40% of their exclusive economic zone. Don't know the parties. You are the Marina to the Hills. Seeing the fire as it used to be. See the ocean as it should be and try to bring it back.
Okay, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. This is what we do. This is what we have been doing for the last 10 years. It's been very intense, a lot of work, but also it's been a privilege to be able to go to some of the wildest and most remote places in the ocean. This map shows where we have been. The blue places are places we have been to. The green places are areas where we have been to and have been already protected. We've been to 25 places and 18 of them are now fully protected from fishing. And the total area, if you put all of this green together, the total area is huge, is half the size of Canada. And we will continue working on this for the next few years. We at National Geographic are committed not only to explore the world and to bring it to you through videos and magazine articles and social media, but also to protect it because there is too much fishing, the warming pollution, especially now plastic pollution. So we all need to work together to save as much ocean as possible because our lives depend on it. And we have been to amazing places like this one in the Russian Arctic. We were the lucky ones who were welcomed by the Russian government to do an expedition to their Arctic coast. This is a place called Franz Josef Land. It's the, most, the northernmost group of islands in the world and now is protected. And we've been from the Arctic to the tropics. This is to me, the perfect image of the coral reef, the virgin healthy coral reef where the bottom is covered by live coral and the waters are full with predators like these sharks. And we've been diving in majestic forest of algae. These are giant kelp. This seaweed grow 60 foot in, in height. You are at the bottom at 60 feet and the plants get all the way to the surface. And these protected areas are also good for the fishermen because when you don't kill the fish, what happens? Well, they take a longer time to die. They grow larger, they reproduce, they have more babies. And many of these fish move outside the boundaries of these protected areas so people can catch them. And also it's good for tourism. These are Japanese divers in a protected coral reef in a small country called Palau near the Philippines in the Western Pacific. People go to places where they can see wild nature. People don't go to dead places. So these uh, protected areas can bring a lot of jobs and money through tourism. This is what we do. This is what uh, our goal and our mission is to keep these places protected and to bring back as many places as possible. And there are many, many things I would like to tell you, but I just want you guys to have an idea of what we do. So now we can have a discussion because I'd love to hear what you're thinking, you know, what, uh, what has been your experience with the ocean. And I bet you have many, many questions. All right, Enrique, thank you so much for sharing with us today. You really made me wish I had my scuba gear handy today, but uh, a little landlocked here in Guelph, Ontario, unfortunately. All right, well, let's meet some of our classrooms and let's get some questions. So let's open up the first mic we are going to go to let's see let's go to sherwood park alberta first we have grade fours joining us with uh, mrs st john let me turn her microphone on looks like a big group how are we doing grade fours good morning and we can't hear you <laughs> Okay, we'll come back to your class then. <laughs> All right, they're not ready, so we'll come back. Uh, let's go to Mrs. Rennick's class to get things started. Let's go uh, to grade sixes in Pennington, New Jersey. And let's see how loud they can be this morning. How are we doing, grade sixes? <laughs> All right, nice and loud. Who's got a question? What is your favorite of the places you've protected and why? Well, this is like, which is the favorite of your siblings, right? Uh, it's a tricky question. We love every single place we have been to. And let me give you a few examples. The Russian Arctic, that place was extraordinary because we saw uh, walruses with the big tusks, schools of hundreds and polar bears. 
but also these coral reefs in the middle of the Pacific with all these sharks are extraordinary. But if I had to recommend one place, I would say you have to go to the Galapagos Islands of the coast of Ecuador in, in Central America. The Galapagos Islands is an extraordinary place and you can tell your parents, this is a great place for family vacation. Uh, it's a place where on land you see these giant tortoises that can be more than a hundred years old. You have iguanas, these lizards, the only iguana that eats in the ocean. It goes, it, it dives and goes down to eat seaweed. And then underwater, you can swim with a school of 200 hammerhead sharks, while a, a 40 foot whale shark cruises by. The Galapagos Islands, I, I would say, is one of my favorite places in the entire world. All right, I will back you up on that one. I spent 10 days in the Galapagos and it was far too short. It was absolutely phenomenal. Uh, let's go back to Mrs. Rennick's class. If you guys have another question, come on up. Yeah, um, what is the um, coolest and craziest sea animal you've ever seen underwater? The craziest sea animal? I pr it's, it was probably a person uh, diving. Uh, <laughs> no, there are crazy animals out there. For example, the whale shark. It's a shark that eats plankton, that eats microscopic organisms, right? It's huge. The, the big animals can be 45, 45 feet long, four or five, it's huge. And uh, also we have seen in the deep sea, when we have dived with the submarine, we have seen these deep sea sharks and these deep sea fish, like the chimera, a fish which is gray, but looks like the space shuttle with big eyes. You know? And there are these, these uh, schools of jellyfish, these jellyfish that can be also 20 feet long. Now the entire ocean is full of wonderful creatures and, and weird creatures from the smallest to the largest. You just need to spend as much time as possible underwater if you want to see cool stuff. All right. Thank you, New Jersey. We'll probably swing back if we have some time towards the end, but let's go visit another classroom. This time we're going to jump to Mrs. Gallagher's group. Grade six is joining us in Hillsborough, New Jersey. Let me turn their microphone on. How are we doing, grade sixes? Hey, All right, who's got a question? All right, who's got a question? Okay, go. Yeah, probably a little closer so that way they can hear you. Right here, good. Do all of your protected areas have people living near them? Good question. Um, most of our protected areas don't have people living in them or near them. We decided to go to the wildest places in the ocean because these are the places where we can still see what the ocean was like a thousand years ago, right? And we are trying to save them before it's too late. But in some other places, we have people like in the Galapagos Islands. There are uh, 30,000 people living in the Galapagos. And every year, about 200,000 people come as tourists to see the place. Uh, and there are 400 fishermen living there. So we are working with the National Park of the Galapagos to make sure that the fishermen fish sustainably in only in parts of the reserve and making sure that they don't uh, damage the local environment. But as you can imagine, the more people you have, the less fish you have, and the more difficult it is to protect the place. All right, and the microphone's coming back on if you guys have another question in New Jersey. You have another one? I like your sea turtle on the, on the wall. I can see it oh, in the background. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we love our sea turtles. Come on up. Because the camera's right there. All right, guys, try to tuck in so she can come through. Thank you. Um, where was the most dangerous place you've been to? The most dangerous place? Um, you know what? When we go on expeditions, we, you know, to go on an expedition, I am home. I take, I take a cab to go to the airport, right? I get on a plane to go to a place. Then I get on a boat. Then we go to a place from with a boat, we dive, and we dive with lots of sharks, right? Or sea snakes, or giant manta rays. 
And people ask me, oh, are you afraid of the sharks? Are the sharks dangerous? Actually, guess what's the most dangerous part of the entire expedition? The cab ride from home to the airport. That's the most dangerous part. You are more likely to have an accident on the road than diving with sharks. So really, uh, li diving with marine animals is not, is not uh, dangerous. Jellyfish are dangerous, right? There are these big jellyfish that can sting you, and that's pretty painful. But uh, do you know how many people? Yes, you can, you can use you, you, yeah, yes, you can write it down or use your hands to tell me. How many people are killed by sharks every year around the world? Two. You have two there. Well, anybody else? Five. That's pretty good. Yeah, you guys are pretty good. You are very well, uh, you are very knowledgeable. Around the world every year, only five people on average are killed by sharks. You know, that's less people than the people who kill themselves taking selfies last year. Yes, you laugh. You all take, you love to take, you are young guys with a phone and you like to take selfies. So people fell off balconies, the stairs, etc. So 15 people killed themselves taking selfies. That's three times more than people killed by sharks. So you tell me what's dangerous, the shark or your, or your smartphone? Thank you. So careful with your smartphone. <laughs> All right, that is such a good point. I, you know, you look at the statistics, and it's uh, the sharks should be afraid of us. Seventy-five to one hundred million a year we take out of the ocean, they should definitely be afraid of us. All right. All right. Well, let's jump to another classroom. Let's go to uh, Mrs. Gale's group this time. We've got grade seven and eight students in Charlotte Lake, Ontario. And Mrs. Gale, uh, you'll just have to turn the mic on for me. Oh. <laughs> Oh, thank you. All right, who's got a question? Carly. No one. Uh, no, Carly, ask Do you know what the world's biggest problem so far with the ocean is? Sorry, I couldn't hear the, I couldn't hear the question, sorry. Oh, Do you know what the world's biggest problem with the ocean is? Yes. It's us. It's people. It's people, but there are three main things we are doing to the ocean. One. We are taking fish out of the ocean faster than they can reproduce. That's called overfishing. You know, we're, we're fishing too much and many fish populations are, are crashing. You know, right now we have too many boats out there chasing too many fish, too few fish. Number two, it's pollution, especially plastic pollution. I don't know if you guys have seen the, the June issue of the National Geographic magazine the cover that has a plastic bag on the ocean. Uh, plastic yes. is a huge issue. We are throwing so much, we are using all this uh, single use plastic like drinking straws or supermarket plastic bags. And we are discarding all of that. We are wasting so much plastic that every minute, every minute is the equivalent of a garbage truck full of plastic going into the ocean, every single minute. Right? So that's a big problem. And this plastic in the ocean ends up killing 1 million seabirds and 100,000 marine mammals like whales and dolphins and seals. And number three is climate change. We are throwing all this carbon pollution into the, into the atmosphere. And much of this uh, carbon pollution, the CO2, is absorbed by the ocean the extra heat that we are creating because of our industrial activities goes into the ocean. So this uh, warming of the waters of the ocean is melting the ice in the Arctic and it's killing coral reefs all around the world. So these are the three main problems. But the, the number one problem is in us. We are just being too destructive to our planet, to our home. All right. And that issue that Henri's talking about, I have it right here. This is the latest issue. See, it kind of looks like an iceberg. 18 billion pounds of plastic a year into our oceans. That's crazy. Um, Mrs. Gales Group, go ahead with another question if you have one. To get to your position, did you guys have to study zoology? Oh, yes. So, well, we have to study a lot. So you, you guys make sure that you continue st studying hard. I had to, I studied biology first. 
And uh, I studied back in Barcelona in Spain. And back then, we had to study botany, plants, you know, zoology, genetics, microbiology, geology, math, physics, chemistry. So I had to study all these basic scientific uh, disciplines to have a little knowledge of uh, about everything. And then I specialized in marine biology right, and oceanography. But absolutely, if you want to have a job of explorer or marine biologist, you need to know your marine animals. So zoology is an absolute necessity. All right, let's take a quick trip to Waterloo, Ontario. We have a couple students joining us. Uh, let me turn their microphone on and see if they have a question today. Um, there isn't protected ocean in Canada. How can we change that? Canada, you are absolutely right. Uh, very little of Canadian waters are protected. The government, the current government, the Trudeau government, uh, said that by 2020, 10 percent of Can Canadian waters are going to be protected. I hope it's true. But the best thing you can do is to uh, write a letter with your friends and send it to the Minister of Fisheries, Mr. Dominique Leblanc, and another one to uh, Prime Minister uh, Justin Trudeau. And uh, organize as many schools as you can in Canada. Right? Use your skills and connections with the social media to make sure that the Minister of Fisheries, the Minister of the Environment, Catherine McKenna, and the Prime Minister, they all hear from the children of Canada telling them, we want more ocean protection. We want uh, less destructive fishing and more ocean protection. And if you make this a big deal, if you have thousands of kids from all around the country asking them that, I think that will have an influence. So I think you should start today. What about that? That's good. All right. And before we jump to our next class, do you guys have another question or should we go to the next group? Um, how can we help with your work? Sorry, I didn't understand the question. Sorry. How can we help with your work? Uh, Sorry, can you? I, I, the connect, the sound is really bad. Yeah, that's okay. She's wondering how can how can they help with your work? How can students get more involved with Pristine? Oh, right. Yeah. Yes. No. Well, there are many things you can do, but one I already said, you should have your class and then as many classes in schools around the country to send letters to the ministers and the prime minister telling telling them that you want more ocean protection. But then the plastic issue. This is something that everybody can do something about. The plastic pollution is a real serious threat, not only to the ocean, but ourselves. Because the fish are eating plastic now, you know, and we eat fish. So you know where the plastic ends up, right? We are, we are ending up eating the trash that we throw into the ocean. But we cannot see it. But we are doing that already. So make sure that you and your family and your friends don't use single-use plastic. Supermarket bags, say no. Plastic straws, say no. Water bottles, plastic bottles, say no. Make a petition, sign a letter to your mayor, the mayor in your town, saying we don't want plastic bags and plastic straws. You should ban, ban them now. India has committed to getting rid of all the single-use plastic in a few years. There are countries like Chile that has already prohibited plastic bags. So, you know, if the children of the country tell the leaders, stop, we want this to happen, you guys can have an influence, but we need as many of you as possible. So that's the two things I would do. More protection of ocean and, and let's ban, let's prohibit single-use plastic that is so bad for the ocean. All right, some great advice for students to get started to try and make a difference. So let's jump to our group in Alberta this time. Uh, turn the microphone back on and see how they're doing. How's everyone doing over there? Good. All right, do you have a question for us now? Anybody have a question? Uh, sure, go ahead. Yeah. 
Just sit right there. Right there. How deep did you dive? Well, um, it depends. If I am scuba diving, right? If I have a, a, a tank on my back and I am breathing underwater, the deepest I have been is 300 feet. We're using special equipment. But then we also use submarines that allow us to go deeper. So with the submarine, I have been to 500 meters at 1,500 feet. But then we have these special cameras. They are like a glass ball about this size, like a big watermelon with lights and a high definition camera inside. And these cameras, we can drop off the side of the boat to any depth in the ocean. We have dropped them to the deepest point in the ocean. And anybody here on this class, do you know what's the deepest point in the ocean and how deep it is? Anybody, go ahead, that, that, that girl with the glasses on the, on the back. All right, your mic's on. Uh, okay. Sorry, we didn't hear you. Which part? Mariana Trench. Yes, the Mariana Trench. And how deep is that? I don't know. <laughs> it's 11,000 meters, 11 kilometers, or almost uh, six miles deep. Yeah, so we have dropped cameras to the bottom of the Mariana Trench. They have filmed and they have come back to the surface. So basically, even though we can dive only in the first 300 feet, we have technology now, National Geographic, that allows us to explore all of the ocean from the surface to the depth. Amazing. Let's grab one more question from our class in Alberta. How about plastic in the ocean? Anybody have a question about plastic in the ocean? Can you go ahead? Here she comes. Don't be shy, don't be shy. I cannot hear you. Nice and loud. Was that how much plastic is in most of the ocean? Yes. Yes, lots of plastic. Okay, that is a lot of plastic. Too much plastic. As I said, we are throwing so much plastic into the ocean that that's the equivalent of one garbage truck full of plastic every single minute. Imagine that, every single minute, every hour, every day. It's crazy, so much plastic. It's eight million tons of plastic every year. And we have plastic everywhere in the ocean. Now, some plastic you can see is the big piece of plastic like a buoy or a plastic bottle or a straw, plastic bag. And these plastic bags, you know, most people think about this. You go to the supermarket, they give you a plastic bag or, or many, you carry the stuff home, right? And then that's it. And most people throw them away. The life, the, the life of the plastic bag, you have used the plastic bag for 15 or 20 minutes only. But these plastic bags will take 400 years to disintegrate in the bottom of the ocean. 400 years. Can you imagine? And we are using billions of plastic bags every year around the world. So we have found plastic bags at the bottom of the ocean, the deepest parts, but also all these big pieces of plastic, because of the action of the waves in the sun, they break down in smaller pieces. And much of the plastic now is in microscopic shape. It's so small that you cannot see it with your naked eye. Right? We call it microplastics because they are microscopic in size. And these microscopic particles, we have microplastics all over the ocean. In our expeditions and National Geographic, we have been to the Antarctica, to the Arctic, to coral reefs, to islands in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And everywhere we have been, we have collected samples of water, we have collected um, volumes of water, and we have found microplastics in every one of them. So basically, we are turning the ocean into a plastic soup. But there is a solution, right? We have to stop using and wasting. We have to stop wasting plastic. If we stop using single-use plastic, that's the start, right? We can do it. We can stop plastic from getting into the ocean and killing millions of marine animals. 
All right. So, Enrique, we, a few weeks ago, your team was in Colombia off Mount Palo doing some diving. There was hundreds of dives going on, all kinds of crew members. There was even a submersible doing dives. How long, how complicated is it to plan one of these expeditions? Oh, that's uh, very, very complicated. And some countries are more difficult than others. But first, we need to choose, for example, let's go to Colombia, right? There is an island called Malpelo of the Colombian coast in the Pacific Ocean. OK, so we want to go. We need to choose the first uh, season, the first, uh, the best time of the year. You know, we don't want to go during hurricane season, right? We want to go when the weather is good. And we have to start planning one year in advance. We have to find a ship. National Geographic doesn't have uh, research boats. So we need to find a research boat, right? Or, or a diving boat that is going to take us there. So we have to identify the boat and then we have to um, talk to these people and, and have a you know, charter that boat. Then we have to ship all of our gear on a big shipping container ahead of time so we can put it in the boat. Then we have to uh, contact local scientists, local experts who are going to come on the expedition. Then we have to um, apply for permits from the Colombian government, for example, in this case, right? And that's a lot of paperwork. We have to uh, tell them what type of research we're going to do, what type of filming we're going to do. And usually it takes months to get a permit from a government. It, there is a lot of bureaucracy, right? So when we have all of that, then, and that takes months, then we have to do research. We have to go uh, to the library or online and read everything that has been written about that place, all of the scientific research that has been previously done for that place. In many places, there's not much, but we need to know what's been done so we can know what we need to know, right? What, what is the, the, going, the research uh, that we're going to do? So there's a lot of pieces. Huh? And then we go on the expedition. We have a great time. We wake up at 7 in the morning, have breakfast, do two dives in the morning, come back for lunch, another dive in the afternoon, come back, uh, rinse the equipment, charge batteries, enter the data on the computer, edit photos, have dinner and poof, collapse because we are exhausted. And that's for periods of weeks, you know, two, three, four, five weeks. Then we return, we have to pack everything back, ship everything to the next place we're going to dive. And then everybody goes home and we have to analyze the data, write the scientific reports, uh, write the articles for the magazine, produce the films. We have 100, 200 hours of footage, but then we have to make the films, right? It takes uh, between three and six months to produce a one hour show for National Geographic. And we do that four or five times a year. We go to four or five different places. So it's a, it's a big job. Uh, we don't have much uh, free time, uh, but we have, and our team is small. You know, Pristine Sis is only 25 people but we have to learn to be very efficient. But the most important thing is that everybody working on our project, they are not working with us because they need a job. They working with us because this is their dream job. They work with Pristine Seas, with National Geographic, because this is a passion project, a passion job. These people are the happiest people, the happiest worker you will ever see, right? They know that the ocean is in trouble. They know what we can do about it. And, you know, we work very hard and so far we've been able to protect wonderful places in the ocean and we will continue working to protect more. All right. Well, it just sounds incredible. So currently the team is in the Azores and we just had a live connection with them from the ship on the 6th. So if you guys have some time today, head over to the National Geographic Education YouTube page and you can find a hangout we did from Columbia on board the ship. You can also find the recent one we did in the Azores. And we'll be doing another live event with them. I believe it's going to be June 18th. So keep an eye on the National Geographic Education YouTube page for that. Well, boys and girls, thank you so much for today. Your questions, as always, were great. Thank you for spending a little bit of World Ocean Day with us. And Enrique, thank you so much for, first of all, everything you're doing and your team to protect our planet. It's so important, our ocean. And uh, thank you so much for taking some time out of your busy day on World Ocean Day to hang out with us. It's my pleasure. Happy Ocean Day, everyone. Thank you so much. All right. Microphones are coming on. Nice shaving out. The thank you. All right.
Alrighty, Enrique, again, thank you so much for hanging out, boys and girls. Thank you so much. It was lots of fun. Enjoy the rest of your World Ocean Day. And remember some of those things uh, we talked about today, reducing your use of plastic, writing to your government officials. Those are the kind of things that are going to make a difference. So thanks, everyone, and enjoy your World Ocean Day. Bye-bye.